I hope you can hear me. I think we're going to start. The last panel was fascinating and took a little bit more time, but we're going to try to make this as fascinating as possible as well in a different, uh, kind of a different direction, which, as you know, is the economic part of the equation. I'm Jill Doherty. Um, I am, I guess, a, a former, or as we say, recovering journalist. I worked with CNN for about three decades, mostly uh, in the international side of CNN, especially in Moscow. And uh, now I'm kind of in the academic world, and both of those got me here to this podium to uh, moderate a discussion, which I think will be really good. We have some top-notch people, obviously. And you've, I think you've seen in your brochures who exactly is on this panel. But maybe I'll introduce them and then set it up. I'll give you a, a roadmap of what we're going to do. Uh, it's now about 5.30. We want to finish by 6.45. And I want to make sure that there's a lot of time for questions. So we will have, um, I'll say a few words. We will do a vote, which is that uh, you heard about the uh, survey that you're going to have on your smartphones. You might want to begin pulling up the app for, uh, for the conference so you can vote on this question. And then we're going to open it up, have some opening comments for about five minutes from each person, have a discussion, and then we'll make sure that we have, I'd say, about 20 minutes to a half an hour of questions. So if we're, we're uh, ready to begin, we have three panelists uh, to discuss this issue. And uh, the man in the middle, I would have to say, is uh, one of our more distinguished participants today. That is Valdis Dombrovskis. He's the former prime minister. And as Edward Lucas said, he's the most important Latvia, Latvian in the world. And I think you would have to say that because he's European commissioner, vice president of Euro, European Euro and Social Dialogue, and also in charge of financial stability, financial services, and capital markets union. Then we have on the left, on your, le on your right, we have Edward Lucas. He's senior editor at The Economist. Edward and I go back to Moscow. We've known each other for a long time. And then our third uh, expert here is P Associate Professor Dr. Balkan Devlin. Dr. Devlin is from the Faculty of Business, Political Science, and International Relations at Izmir University of Economics. So all three of our guests, thank you very much for being here. And you know, when I was asked to do this, I was trying to come up with some sort of, um, let's say, overarching way to approach this, because we could talk about many, many different uh, aspects, I think, of the economy, both um, in Europe and the United States and worldwide. And so what I was trying to do was look at big themes. And I think one of the big themes that I know that we will get into is the battling these forces of disintegration. I mean, if think back, the whole idea, of course, about economics and trade and trade agreements was to unite countries and to make it easier to trade. And now what we have really worldwide, are the forces of disintegration. I see it in the United States right now in the presidential uh, election campaign, um, where people, you have uh, various issues. Even Brexit is affecting the US presidential campaign. Certainly in Europe, you have Brexit, migration, and anti-globalism, all playing a very strong role. Um, you also, I think, even in some of these, let's say, political and social issues, you have economics at the heart of them. The lack of trust among people who live in liberal democracies, the lack of trust that they believe that their government can actually provide what they need and want, which would be good jobs, um, rising incomes, and some type of stability. Many people in many countries right now feel left out of whatever is happening in the world economy, and that is creating enormous, as we know, 
uh, social and political problems. So let's begin, um, as I said, with some opening comments. And I know there will be probably a lot of kind of gloom and doom and a lot of concern when we talk about economics right now. But um, uh, Minister Dombrovskis, I'd like to begin with you. If you could take a, a big, oh, well, actually, you know what? I wanted to do that vote. Could I do that now? Um, let's do this so we, we at least have an idea of how the audience looks at one of those major issues. That's the survey, and I'm gonna start it right now. And I hope, if that works, you're going to be able to see. Do you see the question on your screens there, on your phones? I hope. Yes? The question being, how serious a threat to the world economy is the growing opposition to free trade agreements? So now, you have choices. Major threat, minor threat, or not a threat. Now, does everybody actually, I'm not a, the person technically who's in charge of this, but can you question. see that? So You're okay? Okay, <laughs> so let's vote. <laughs> Again, how serious the threat to the world economy is the growing opposition to free trade agreements? And we give, what, two minutes, I guess? Whoops, wow. Okay, major threat is leading at 73%. Minor? Not too many people think that it's, <laughs> and no one so far thinks that it's not a threat. So it looks like, okay, I think the vote, I'll say stop survey. And uh, that's let's a see. Wrong, that's that's a different wrong question on there. There it is. Okay. Yeah, is that the only, are you seeing it up there too? Okay, great. So we have major threat, 73%. Minor, 27, whoops, less. Oh, all right, it's changing. 82%, minor threat, 18, and not a threat, zero. So that certainly sets us up for the gloom and doom <laughs> scenario that I was, I was outlining. So Minister Dombrovskis, could you start us out with, I guess the question would be, where, is, uh, where are the people who are in charge, the people who presumably are gonna solve these problems, where are they taking us? Are there good workable ideas out there to bring some type of uh, hope to people in many countries that, the economy, that they will not perish in this, these new economies? Uh, well, uh Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this question. First of all, uh, of course, uh, I would like to thank the organizers of uh, Riga uh, conference for this, uh, as always, excellent organization of the event. And uh, uh, to move to the question on the uh, global and European economy. And uh, I would say not everything is uh, doom and gloom. Uh, if you look at the global economy, economic recovery is uh, continuing. So IMF most recent forecast is a growth of global economy at 3.1% uh, this year and 3.4% next year. And also if you look at the EU, we are currently expecting 1.8% growth uh, in the EU. And actually we are in a fourth year of economic recovery. And actually, we are seeing that uh, finally, all 28 EU member states are getting back uh, to the economic growth. Until recently, it was 27 member states, the only exception being Greece. But now also with uh, Greece, with the completion of the first review, with the uh, Greek loan program being on track, also Greece is returning to the economic uh, uh, growth. So we can also talk that there is a broad base recovery. So what is the issue here is that indeed this recovery is still very modest. So the task is to strengthen this recovery and make it more sustainable. And this is uh, something which is very much in, on global agenda, on G20 and other fora, and it's uh, very much also on EU's agenda. So probably I will start with the 
EU's economic policy priorities to actually strengthen the recovery. And there are three priorities we are concentrating on. First is uh, investment. Actually, one of the first initiatives of this European Commission was investment plan for Europe, well, also known as uh, Juncker Investment Plan, uh, to mobilize at least 315 billion euros of both public and private investment within uh, three years. And now we see that already uh, after the first year of operation, uh, projects which had been approved uh, so far had mobilized some, somewhere in range of 138 billion euros of investment. So we are now extending and expanding the plan, uh, expecting it to uh, generate up to uh, half a trillion euros of investment by 2020. Second priority is uh, structural reforms to modernize our economies and uh, to strengthen the competitiveness. And structural reforms uh, may mean uh, different issues in different member states, but some of the recurring issues are uh, uh, issues related with labor markets, finding the right balance between, uh, mob, uh, between flexibility in labor markets and security for employees, so-called flex security concept. Uh, uh, there are issues uh, uh, related to long-term sustainability of our social systems, given the population aging, on taxation, where our general advice is to shift away tax burden from labor, especially low-paid labor to other tax bases less detrimental to growth, uh, opening up closed professions and a number of other uh, areas. And our third priority is still fiscal responsibility. And there one can say that uh, indeed average budget deficit in EU continues to go down from 2.4% uh, of GDP uh, last year, we're expecting it to go down to 2.1% uh, this year. But at the same time, when uh, taking into account the economical cycle, when looking at our structural balance, we already see that our current fiscal stance is slightly expansionary, which we think is a right balance given the circumstances when we still need to get our fiscal deficit and debt levels down, but at the same time, we also need to think of the ways to strengthen the economic uh, recovery. So we believe that by pursuing these policy priorities, we can uh, strengthen the recovery and make it more uh, sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Edward, I want to turn to you now. I saw you shaking your head a couple of times, uh, but then I saw you taking notes. So I'm wondering um, where you would pick up from that. It sounds like correct steps are being taken, um, albeit, you know, it's a modest recovery. Do you agree that it's a modest recovery? Well, I think that it's clear that we've steered away from the disaster that some people were prophesying very confidently um, back in the depth of the crisis, um, both the disaster that was prophesied in Latvia, which um, Prime, then Prime Minister Dombrovskis um, steered the country out of, but also the kind of acute, um, the acute phase of the financial crisis. I think my worry is that this is a very modest recovery, as uh, Valdis said, and also that our policy levers are pretty much maxed out for the next shock or downturn. It's you know, one of the basic points about economics is that things go up and then they go down. And if you're prudent during the times when things are good, um, then you have some ammunition for when uh, times are bad. And if you look at the main levers of economic policy, um, they're all the le those levers are all pretty much stuck at maximum. We can't really do very much more on monetary policy. Interest rates are at rock bottom. Um, we've done everything we can, I think, on quantitative easing. Some of this monetary policy is actually having perverse effects. It may actually be contractionary to have really low interest rates because it puts pension funds in such um, difficulty. Um, so there's not much we can do on monetary policy. As um, Valdis said on fiscal policy, um, we've clawed our way back to a, a reasonable level of responsibility. Um, but it would be very difficult to have a, a big fiscal expansion 
if, the, if, if we had a downturn. And perhaps most worrying of all, there's really no appetite for structural reform and further integration. This is a time when the, supposedly during the upturn, you should be doing all the things to uh, make your economy more flexible and more competitive, and we just haven't been um, doing that or doing it very slowly. And I think the message of this is that, the, um, that politics is actually trumping Trumping, sorry, that's not the pun. Is trumping, <laughs> we'll get to that later. Um, is, 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 is trumping economics, and there's such a feeling among the population of uh, unfairness, of powerlessness, of resistance to what the elite has been doing that it's proving really difficult uh, to get the things done that we need. And the latest sort of fiasco over the free trade agreement with Canada that we've seen, I think just underlines that. But the bigger picture is that TTIP seems to be pretty much dead. Even Hillary Clinton's pulled out from supporting um, TTP. So the whole idea that you push the world economy forward by doing more free trade and more integration um, has, has, has stalled. In fact, The Economist, um, where I work, had a very good cover um, a few issues back, saying that the real divide now in the world is between um, the openers and the closers. And the openers want to continue more integration, more openness of goods, services, labor, capital, um, people, uh, and so on. And the closers say this has all gone far too fast. We feel disempowered and threatened, and uh, we, do, we don't like this. And we want to batten down the hatches and go back to um, more closed models of economy. And I think that's right. And I'm not sure we're winning that at the moment. What do we do about it? Um, I, I mean, I agree that with what Valdis has done, I think, are necessary, but they're not sufficient conditions. I think we need to um, be much tougher on what one might call corporate welfare and rent-seeking. If you want people at the bottom to feel that the economy is being run fairly, you really need to go after the unjustified privileges of the rich, and that's everything from looking at the way in which we... Uh, tax land, for example, and land value um, through to the sort of privileges that cartels and well-connected um, companies uh, enjoy. So making sure that competition and disruption apply to the rich and the privileged as well as the people at the, at the bottom. Um, continuing to clean up our financial system, um, which is and our, our banking system, which, which brought us into the crisis last time, is still, I think, one, at best one can say it's convalescing and there are a few countries, Canada, you know, which we are all very grateful to here in Latvia, um, has got a very strong banking system. The Swedish banks are very strong. So you can have a strong banking system, but most of Europe is still afflicted with banks that are um, far too weak and not able to send credit flowing to the economy. So we need to do a lot more on that. And of course, that's very difficult. Because if you say, let's clean up the banking system, that means getting the banks to put all their assets in a bad bank, maybe selling those assets off. That means people losing homes, businesses going bust, a lot of creative destruction in the economy. And when we see that in Greece, and when they try and do that, and people riot. There was a great story in the Wall Street Journal about a notary who was trying to oversee the sale of a block of an apartment block or a, a building which belonged to a bank that had gone bust. And people stormed into her office. She hid under the desk. They beat her up, pulled her file out from which she was sitting on, and ripped it up. You know, that's what happens when you start, um, when people are really desperate and unhappy and you're trying to clean up a financial system. So it's not easy. I think we need to do a much better job in cushioning people from shocks. You know, the North European countries are really good at doing this with um, unemployment insurance and wage insurance and so on. But if we, we, I think we were far too um, overconfident, far too blithe in the past 20 years about what the losers from globalization would do. And we thought, well, they'll have to like it or lump it because the world's globalizing, you can't stand in its way. Well, maybe you can't stand in its way, but they will vote, and they will vote for Brexit, and they will vote for Trump, and they will vote for AFD or the Sweden Democrats or anybody else. And it's a, the reasons are often very inchoate. It's a mixture of worries about economic change and social change and migration and so on. But so long as we live in democracies where these people can vote, we need to um, take that much more um, seriously. And then finally, we do need to push ahead with um, keeping the economy open and making it more open. So I say particularly in the European Union, we really need to get the digital single market going. This is so important. It immediately adds a couple of percentage points to economic growth. And we have a fantastic single market um, in goods. We have a beginnings of a single market in services, although not really enough. But it would be so important to push ahead with the, um, with the, the digital 
um, single market. Um, and I think we need to make the Eurozone, um, and I'm sure, I know Valdis will say there's great political obstacles to this, but I think the common currency has got to be backed by really strong institutions. You can't do this without, I think, without a banking union and without fiscal transfers. It just becomes politically um, unsustainable. And then finally, we've got to push ahead with free trade agreements. We've got to try and revive um, TTIP and you know, we hope the Walloon, Wallonian legislature, whatever it is, has now passed the uh, um, CETA. But we've got to keep, you know, global trade is the great engine of prosperity. This is what li has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the last uh, 30, 40 years. It's the greatest engine of wealth creation and prosperity that the world has ever seen. And we are allowing the sand to get into the gears, and the gears are going slower and slower and slower. And in some cases, they're going back. And I think this is, it's a, it is, I'm sorry to be gloomy, but I do think it's a very worrying time. Thank you. Um, Professor Devlin, <clears throat> you know, um, Edward was talking about cushioning people from shocks. And we can all see how these shocks are having real uh, political uh, ramifications. Mm -hmm. Uh, political shocks, which are turning, you know, d votes, the Brexit vote coming unexpectedly, uh, Americans on edge right now, not quite knowing how the election will ultimately end. Um, I know your area is more, you know, let's, let's call it political science in international relations. On the political science side of it, What's your analysis? What is all of this, the problems that Edward was talking about, the minister talking about potential solutions, but everyone realizing is still very fragile. Where do you come down in terms of what we're headed for, p perhaps for another shock? Uh, I think, well, <laughs> three things are, um, are interesting here. One is the fact that the... Um, the sluggish economic growth that continues in the past couple of years um, exacerbates three other challenges to uh, the liberal world order, uh, which at least to me feeds into, again, um, to some of the problems we have. What are they? Uh, first, increasing uh, populism, nativism um, across the Western world. The second one is the authoritarian uh, resurgence in the case of uh, the Russia we see at least the way of pushing for it and becoming more try to be becoming more relevant for world politics and the third one is the uh, Salafi jihadism uh, not only in terms of what is going on in Syria and Iraq but also as terror attacks in the West um, now economic growth making all these three things or the sluggish economic growth or the lack of it uh, make the, all these three things um, express itself themselves even uh, even more in the sense that uh, both uh, Mr. Prime Minister and and uh, Mr. Lucas um, mentioned the role of um, how and why what people sometimes call the losers of globalization uh, started to react uh, in the West, particularly by voting for right wing uh, populist parties, by the rise of um, more and more nativist um, movements, which is further uh, sort of exacerbated by the refugee flows uh, to Europe, uh, and then the whole debate about terror attacks in the West and how uh, Trump uh, uh, Trump campaign, for example, uses that as as, as such. Uh, what people are feeling, at least to, to me, what I, I, I see, at least significant parts of the population. Uh, uh, is, is that both their economic security and their physical security is sort of slipping away and the political elites are not uh, paying attention to it. Now, when times are good, when you could provide a wider uh, welfare uh, security net, uh, when you know, people are not so much worried about uh, whether there's this new neighbor coming up or there's this new, new person uh, getting into country and so, so forth. But, but when times started to get tough and, and people start to question those things, there is this possibility and there's the reality of increasing, uh, increasing populist nativist uh, sentiments, which uh, strengthen anti-globalization 
uh, uh, moments in the, one, in the sense that, that, that they try to argue for less free trade rather than more free trade. Uh, a, a great example, and, and in some of the institutional uh, you know, structures of uh, European Union, for instance, enables uh, that uh, to be expressed at, at, the, at the EU level as well, as the recent, uh, recent example of one of the Belgian uh, provinces almost blocking uh, the free trade agreement with Canada. It was sort of last minute deal that managed to overcome, but I am pretty sure that's not going to be the only one or only time a similar uh, uh, attempt will be made. Now, to what extent the, uh, the, the merits of that particular opposition is a different story, but what is out there is, is that there is this increasing uh, frustration that the, the, the voters, at least in, 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 in Western Europe and increasingly in, uh, in the United States, express about the free trade, about l the way the liberal world order works. Uh, and, and having less of economic growth doesn't really help. It actually exacerbates that and it feeds into it. And there is further changes, particularly with regards to uh, long-term, at least in, in, in the West, long-term um, uh, uh, trends with regards to demographics, with the need, uh, with, with aging population, with the need to have uh, new labor, with the need to have a younger population, at least getting into the West to be able to continue uh, a sense uh, or at least a, a, a modicum of even a, a modest growth. Now that, of course, clashes with the nativist populist uh, uh, rhetoric and, and narrative. Uh, how are you going to do both of them? How are you going to satisfy uh, the sort of the fears, whether they're founded or not, is, is, is immaterial, but what the real, at least, people feel with regards to increased immigration, increasing number of refugees, uh, with the need to have uh, those people, at least for the economic purposes, to be able to develop uh, your economy, and without that, you are actually, you know, feeding back into uh, into uh, the problem of vulnerability, the problem uh, of of being in a precarious uh, economic position. And how are we going to solve that? Well, I don't, I don't know. That's a six million dollar question. Uh, but I think uh, two two things are uh, are obvious. One is uh, it is no longer possible to go back. Uh, to the way things were, say, in 1990s, when everyone is arguing for more and more free trade and open trade, and sort of the uh, Washington consensus being the rule. Uh, that is at least not politically possible. But it is obvious that the reversing the direction, engaging in protectionism, engaging in uh, policies that limit uh, uh, trade, let limit globalization, financial globalization, etc., will not work either. We have been down that road uh, before in, uh, in the entire war years, in early 20th century. And that's not gonna, we know how that turns out. It's not a good idea anyway. Uh, whatever we need to come up, we need to be able to do two things. One, we need to be able to develop uh, a cushion, as, as Mr. Lucas was said, to, a, a form of cushion for the most vulnerable of uh, the uh, of the public uh, to provide them with a sense of security. And the second thing we uh, really need to be um, uh, paying attention to is that we need to be able to s sell this idea to the voters, uh, uh, especially in the in, in the West, that globalization and and and, and free trade is not. Uh, it might look like it's hurting, and we are providing these extra measures to take care of it, but protectionism, et cetera, is not the way to go. Um, I, will, I will let that, uh, mm -hmm. that one. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister Dombrovskis, um, both gentlemen have mentioned this issue of aging, and there was an article, uh, I think it was yesterday, in the Financial Times specifically about aging and how it's an issue, obviously, in many developed countries, and they were saying that low investment, low interest rates, and low output growth are here to stay because of aging. Do, do you agree that this is one of the 
uh, chief problems that, that the West has right now? And if so, I know this is, you don't have all the time in the world probably to explain it, but how do you deal with an aging population? Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, aging is uh, one of the issues which uh, the Western world and uh, European Union is uh, uh, facing and something we need uh, to uh, adapt to. Of course, uh, there are things uh, we can uh, do, uh, provide some uh, stimulus for improving the demographic situation. There are things we can do through the uh, uh, legal migration, through some other uh, uh, avenues, but it's also clear that actually uh, we will need to adapt to the fact that population is uh, aging, that uh, uh, there will be less uh, uh, people of working age to support uh, uh, people of uh, uh, pensions uh, age. Actually, uh, some uh, uh, rough estimates say that it could go from four people at working age to one person above 64 uh, uh, years uh, by so somewhere uh, uh, mid-century uh, or 2060. It could go actually to two people of working age. Uh, supporting uh, one uh, uh, person over 64 years. So, indeed, uh, this challenge is very there. That's when I was mentioning the structural reform agendas. Uh, I was specifically mentioning the fact of long-term sustainability of our social systems. And this is something which we need to address uh, already now, because the more timely it gets addressed, the less dramatic changes you need uh, to make. So, you cannot really uh, try to uh, delay this problem because uh, 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 this issue is really there and you see those long-term uh, tendencies. And we need to adopt our uh, labor markets, uh, among other things, trying to facilitate that also people at older ages stay longer in the labor market. So this certainly will be uh, part of the uh, 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 solution as well. So. Uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, fundamental challenges, actually, uh, we will need to deal in the coming uh, decades. But I would say uh, both speakers also mentioned another word in an one form or another, which I also wanted to emphasize, it's uh, inequality. Mm. And this is also something which is very important for uh, if we want to provide our responses to current economic uh, uh, problems, if we want to uh, continue with our structural reforms agenda, we also need to take measures which reduces inequality so that the benefits of the integration, uh, benefits of the globalization, which economically are there, are actually felt by uh, a broader population that these uh, benefits are more evenly uh, spread. And I would especially emphasize this issue uh, in uh, the Baltic states. Uh, latest uh, data we have on EU on uh, Gini index, so on uh, inequality, uh, shows that actually uh, uh, four out of the four countries uh, which have most inequality in the EU three are the Baltic countries. Mm. So it's uh, uh, the most inequality is in Estonia, followed by Latvia, Bulgaria, and uh, Lithuania. So inequality is indeed something which is particularly pressing issue here in the Baltic uh, states and uh, which uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, really dealt with. Uh -huh. Edward, it turns out that uh, President Vladimir Putin shares this view. I just noticed one thing that he said at the Valdai uh, meeting yesterday, and this is a quote, people sense an ever-growing gap between their interests and the elite's vision. So I, he, um, I, I, he, I, hope, I hope he's talking about Russia there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know you're an expert in that area, but I mean, look, there are, I think you could almost generically say that there are different visions out there. You know, there is the idea of the Western liberal democracies, but there are other ways of doing things, other, let's say, um, models. One would be managed democracy, Mr. Putin's approach, but also the Chinese, and we should definitely talk uh, about yeah. China. 
which is a different type of control. So, uh, well, I think, <laughs> I mean, R Russia is a very specific economic model, which is based on the extraction, rent. collection, and distribution of rents, mainly natural resource rents, which is what you get from the oil and gas and other um, industries, but also transit and, and, then st and, and also bureaucratic rents, which is an economist jargon for bribes. And that's how the Russian economy works. And I don't think many people in other countries look at that and say, that's great, let's try and replicate it. And you don't see people queuing up for visas to go and um, live in Russia or trying to cross the Russian border illegally because they think that they're going to get a much better life there. So I, would, I, I park Russia's sort of economic model a bit on, on one side. I'm, I'm a little bit, I think the, the, the problem with, there are two great mysteries in um, economics, which um, we chew on all the time. Um, one of them is this business about inequality and social mobility. And the truth is we don't really know as much as we would like to know about, it's very easy to reduce inequality. You just make Bill Gates and Warren Buffett emigrate and <laughs> the figures will immediately change. You get rid of a few rich people and the gap between rich and poor will look less, but that's a kind of simplistic approach. But it's, 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 it's an easy problem to talk about. I, I prefer to think about questions of justice rather than questions of, eco of, 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 of equality. because so I think justice is a much crunchier concept. And if you say, how is the pain of change being shared? And is the pain of change being shared fairly and justly? And um, are the benefits of, um, of, of, of economic growth being shared justly? That's a more powerful concept than equality. The other big mystery, and this gets on to aging, um, is productivity. We, are sti we still don't really understand why sometimes we have spurts in productivity and sometimes it plateaus. And particularly with an aging population, this won't matter. If productivity is growing faster than the workforce is aging, we'll be fine. And if productivity is, continues to drop, as it's, it's very low in, in my country, and I, it's one of the few things we can't blame on Brexit, because productivity was bad even before Brexit, um, then, we're, then we're, re we're really stuffed. And so I think, you know, I, I, I'm f although I have the most enormous respect for academic economists, I have even, even more respect for them when they admit that some of the most difficult issues we face are ones that um, economics doesn't have very clear answers to. Well, let's, let's turn to China, though, because I did bring that up. China is such an enormous uh, force, obviously, in world economies. But um, you said, actually, you do have some expertise, obviously, in that area. Um, how would you set up the equation? What is happening in China right now? What's the influence on the world economy? Well, I mean, the, the brutal truth is we don't really know anything about the Chinese economy because the figures are all fake. And they really are. I mean, Chinese GDP, um, real countries with real statistics produce GDP figures quite slowly, um, and they are fairly bumpy, and there's a lot of revisions. China produces GDP statistics with incredible speed, um, usually um, very suspiciously round numbers that exactly fit the plan. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting exercise in creative writing or creative arithmetic, but we don't, you know, there are huge problems in the Chinese economy, also huge strengths. And we are, you know, and I, I'm not sure even the people who run China know that, but I, I, do, I do think, I mean, one, the big point is that China is very heavily invested in the success of the world economy. Um, it's what you might call a systemic competitor. It wants to do well, it wants stability, it wants to continue to grow, um, but it doesn't want a fundamental change in the rules. Um, there are other countries, and um, Russia would be perhaps the prime example, which are doing very badly in the way things are at the moment, and have a much bigger interest in playing some kind of game-changing card where they might do better. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Devlin, uh, there are forces at play that go even beyond what we understand today. That would be robotics, artificial intelligence, different ways of producing, uh, which will mean fewer jobs, no question. If it's bad now, as one person uh, that I spoke to from the tech industry said, you ain't seen nothing yet. So where do we go? What would your, um, your warning or your, your solution be for dealing with societies, these advanced societies, that will have to grapple with fewer jobs because exactly of especially robotics and artificial intelligence? 
I think again that's like that's one of the major questions a lot of people, a lot of people smarter than me are thinking about right now. Uh, one interesting thing recently I was reading is that um, I think last week uh, the first fully automated self-driving truck uh, was uh, making deliveries and that uh, in the same article it was mentioned that in the United States the number one job for men uh, that, that across the jobs in terms of number of people that have is uh, is driving, driving mm -hmm. a truck or driving a bus or uh, working as a driver. And if things go the way they go soon enough, and soon enough meaning maybe in, in five years, six, seven years, we might have a fully, completely self-driving, not only you know, regular automobiles, but also trucks and other things, which we are talking about one of the major, you know, in a way, unskilled jobs uh, going away. now. This is only one of the beginning, and how are we going to uh, deal with that? And that, I think, is, is yes, I agree, it's a major question. One of the threats is that uh, if we just approach the subject as, okay, well, these people need to be retrained and, and we'll engage with that. Well, that might necessarily be the case, okay, for a 20-year-old, but what are you going to do with a 55-year-old truck driver and how are you going to retrain him to do something else? And you cannot push these people out of the economy. They somehow need to survive. Um, and, but, you know, it's not about handouts as well. So how to integrate uh, the jobs uh, the, or, or the loss of jobs and the people who are working in those jobs as a result of technological development uh, should be one of the major issues we need to think uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping a lot more people are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Minister Dombrovskis, I wanted to, we talked a little bit about Russia, but I just wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of Russia's increasing economic um, influence in Europe, not necessarily overtly, but let's say in investment and some I guess the word has been used, covert influence in the economy in Europe, especially in this part of the world. Um, what, what would you say uh, is the impact of Russia and also vis-a-vis -vis uh, uh, political systems that Europe has? Because af after all, Critics would say, critics of Russia would say that they are having a malign influence not only on the economy, but also on the political situation in Europe. What, what is your opinion on that? Uh, well, uh, first, on the uh, thesis of uh, increasing Russian uh, uh, economic uh, influence. Well, this can one, uh, one can safely say for the last uh, couple of years is certainly not the case because uh, <laughs> Uh, after uh, uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine, there are sanctions in place, and actually we uh, uh, see that uh, Russia's uh, share uh, uh, or, uh, of, of trade with the EU, uh, uh, Russia's investment uh, with the EU, including in, uh, in uh, uh, this part of the EU, in the Baltic states, is actually uh, uh, decreasing. So what is uh, more, uh, more worrying right now is uh, actually the uh, military activities. We uh, see the military build up, different kind of maneuvers that are uh, 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 taking, pla uh, uh, taking place around the uh, borders of uh, Baltic states, uh, other uh, uh, countries. So uh, th this, I would say, is more immediate concern. And that's, for example, uh, one of the budgetary priorities of the Baltic states is actually now uh, uh, defense uh, spending, among, uh, uh, among other things, actually making good of uh, meeting the, uh, uh, the NATO criteria of defense spending of 2% of uh, uh, GDP. Uh, then as regards uh, uh, Russia's uh, political uh, influence and also uh, communication influence, it's uh, certainly uh, present. There are a number of uh, studies done uh, to that end, and that's something which you also need to uh, uh, be uh, uh, aware of and counter if uh, uh, necessary. Uh, there are a uh, uh, number of initiatives also at uh, EU level, including on the uh, area of uh, uh, communication, where there is a, 
uh, what's called East uh, uh, Strat Stratcom Task Force uh, to uh, actually uh, improve also EU's uh, informative presence in the Eastern Partnership uh, countries and also to deal with different kind of disinformations. And uh, uh, same issues are being dealt, for example, with, uh, uh, in a context of uh, NATO with uh, uh, Stratcom, which is also one of the uh, 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 purposes of, of this uh, uh, unit. So this is something, uh, indeed, which we need to uh, pay close attention to. Thank mm -hmm. you. Edward, I know you want to jump in, and then I think that will be our last comment, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree that Russia is no longer the El Dorado that it, where 15, 20 years ago you had people absolutely convinced that Russia was the most important economic prospect in Europe and that, that politics should just get out of the way and allow trade and investment to flourish in this tremendously important and attractive emerging market. And it's true, absolutely, people aren't saying that now. Um, but I think one has to be very careful about saying that that means we don't need to worry about Russian economic power and our economic security because Russia doesn't need to have all the levers it just needs to have some and so here in Latvia for example um, you know, this country has a lot of Russian deposits um, in its banking system offshore effectively offshore deposits now that's something Russia can pull the plug on very quickly and I don't know how the Latvian population would react if they were told we have to find another couple of billion euros for another Parrick style bailout. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but once we have these pockets of vulnerability, Russia sees that. It sees, for example, in the city of London, um, that the city is very worried about uh, the effect of sanctions on its very lucrative trade of um, dealing with Russian deposits. If this was an off the record session, I might use another word other than dealing. Um, but, and there's plenty of other countries, Luxembourg, Austria, Cyprus, where dealing with Russian financial flows is, a very, um, is, a very, is, is very important and that creates a vulnerability. Or then look at Italy. Yeah, Italy, Prime Minister Renzi is very keen to try and get economic, crank up economic growth even by just a fraction of a percentage point. And Russia is important um, for all sorts of, of, of industries. And there is Renzi, um, Italian industries, and there's Renzi saying, I don't want to have sanction any, any more sanctions, in fact pushing for sanctions to be lifted. So Russia, what Russia is very good at doing is pulling together these elements, whether it's economic power, energy, finance, espionage, propaganda, all these different military sable rattling, and pulling them all together and creating a kind of joined up threat. And we are not nearly so good at finding a joined up response. Hmm. Okay, I think it's time for questions. Um, let's see, we, do we put up the lights so we can see where everyone is? And I think there's some microphones uh, that we'll be giving out. And also, if you could please identify yourself at the top and then ask your question. There's a gentleman right here in the middle. Right here. Stand up. Yes, if you stand up, that would help. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the panelists for raising some great issues and the moderator. Really appreciate your, the issues you've raised. Um, Could you identify yourself? Yes, I'm sorry. Hamid Lajavardi, American Baltic Investments. The contraction of the Great Recession has had many facets. Um, one that I would like to concentrate, two that I would like to concentrate on, trade and cultural issues which in my opinion reinforce each other. Uh, about trade, of course we all know that trade is a great connector and an expansionary force in economic growth throughout history. Uh, you have a small uh, half nation, Wallonia, that's probably around uh, less than 1% of the EU population, uh, sabotaging an agreement that has taken about seven years to put together. Is it time that in terms of uh, ratifying trade agreements, the EU steps away from absolute majority. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Minister, I think that's, that's and, and The other part, sorry. If you quickly, okay, yes, we want to get quickly. a lot of... Yes, Thank very you. quickly. Uh, cultural issues that have arisen from this contraction, which I don't hear many people talk about, but I think they're very real based on a lot of studies, especially in the United States, as racism and xenophobia. 
um, versus tolerance and integration. Uh, these issues really do affect trade uh, and economic growth. Uh, in fact, uh, they have really arisen because of the contraction. A lot of people say, well, it's left out of the globalization and economic growth. Mm -hmm. But a lot of studies have shown that indeed is partially based on racism and xenophobia. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you could Mr. add both issues. Well, uh, so first on uh, trade. Uh, on uh, trade, it's uh, clearly that also as a EU, uh, we should be doing a much better job in explaining the uh, benefits of the trade agreements and how they actually translates into jobs in Europe. Because that's uh, 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 certainly the case, but it's uh, unfortunately not very thoroughly uh, 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 communicated. So, uh, if we are now talking specifically about uh, CETA, well, we know that agreement has actually been reached with, with uh, Belgium, with uh, uh, Wallonia. So, one, uh, uh, one can be, I would say, uh, 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 optimistic about actually uh, CETA agreement being finally uh, concluded. Uh, that said, we of course see that there are even stronger feelings, uh, say, around uh, TTIP, which is still in a st uh, phase of negotiations. Uh, we see also uh, the debate on uh, TPP in US, yes, yeah. also uh, taking uh, 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 some more uh, negative uh, direction. So, uh, indeed, uh, we see that there is uh, some kind of a backslash against uh, global trade. And as we were discussing uh, uh, that uh, uh, this backla uh, backslash uh, against trade and also uh, 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 things like racism and xenophobia can be actually uh, different facets of the same uh, uh, problem. And this is certainly something which we have to uh, deal with it, uh, like with issues per se, but it's also something which we have to deal with through the economic means, through the economic recovery, through dealing with inequality, so actually making the benefits of integration and globalization better felt across the population. Mm -hmm. Edward, I know you want to jump in. I want to keep a lot of questions going, but if you, could, you have Just a very, comment. Uh, very briefly, I think I mean, you're absolutely right that the um, trade depends on a kind of consensus and acceptance of change, and that, that consensus is frayed. And I think there are four things that people worry about. One is competition for public services or access to public services. They think that our health service won't survive TTIP because the Americans mm -hmm. will come in and you know, sue us and ruin it, or migrants are coming and I can't get to see a doctor anymore. And then there's downward pressure on wages. I'm competing with people on the other side of the world who work 12 hours a day, seven days a week for much less than me. Um, there's the kind of cultural change, that's particularly with um, migration, also crime, which people sometimes... Now, each of these problems can be solved. Yeah, if you have a crime problem, then you have a policing problem. You have to have better policing. Um, you can deal with... Um, if you've got downward pressure on wages, well then you, have, you can insure wages, you can subsidize wages, you can retrain people. Um, you don't have to compete with sweat, people, sweatshops on the other side of the world. Um, with public services, well you need better public services. If public services are being stretched because of migration, um, then you need more public services. So in each case there, uh, there, is, there is a policy response, um, but I think we, 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 fa we failed to make it. And the result of that is that trade agreements become a kind of lightning rod for everything we don't like about modern life, and that's why they're getting, they're getting whacked at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think there was a gentleman in the middle. Did you ever get a mic? Oh, you did? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, hi, I'm Robert Alsha, Swedish Defense Research. Um, the year 1989 ushered in 25 years of liberalization, democracy, globalization, multiculturalism. Now we're seeing the backlash. And um, I wonder, is 2016 the antithesis in a Hegelian sense to the year 1989? And if so, will the backlash last for another 25 years? 
Ooh, what a question. Well, at least we got Hegel in here. Um, P Professor De <laughs> Devlin, could you... <laughs> you're an academic. You yeah, must well, be able to answer exactly. a question like that. Um, well, I think it's, well, it's a very good question in the sense that this, the, the pendulum swinging one way to another and how are we going to deal with that? And whether would it like, well, if it lasts 25 years, what would kind of a world would we live in? I think it would depend whether that would last that way uh, that long would depend on two things. On one, um, nativism is nothing new. It has been always part when you are going through basic change, particularly with regards to population changes. This is this has been the case uh, for the United States. That has been true uh, for a variety of other countries trying to absorb other populations. Uh, they tend to go away after a while, which is about a generation, which is 25 years. Um, so the, that seems to be a bit of overlap there. It might, it will eventually uh, uh, go away. If, if you just think about it and remember when the first sort of, at least the recent populist, uh, uh, before the recent populist uh, you know, upsurge in the United States in the late 19th century, when you have the, a similar uh, moment, it was against the Italians and the Irish and, 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 and whatnot. So, and now which would completely be considered part of the white America, which was not necessarily the case up until uh, 1960s. There was this, the, 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 the debate about Kennedy being an uh, agent of the Pope and all that kind of thing against the Catholics. So things do change and it will probably uh, overcome. Um, what can make that process shorter uh, is, is, I think, one, uh, one, one of the ways is, is to take the concerns of the people uh, seriously. Yes, we're talking about nativism and we're talking about populism and so on and so forth, but it is a mistake uh, to basically uh, uh, disregard all those concerns and saying that this is just a part of, uh, you know, xenophobic, racist uh, people who have no idea what is good for them. Uh, that there is, a, whether you agree with it or not, but there is a concern that they have that their economic livelihood is, 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 is getting out of their hands, their uh, culture is slipping, uh, and what they see as this sort of elite consensus, and that's what the populist party is all around, is, is uh, benefiting from and driving their energy from. Uh, one way to counter that is to go back uh, to a sense of uh, a more communitarian cosmopolitanism, in a sense of more, in the Roman sense, a republicanism, in the, in the sense of uh, talking about the virtues of the community without necessarily putting that as an opposition to an outsider, uh, as, an, as, a, as a hate against the other, but rather than as a pride in own, one's own values and own way of doing things. And, and fostering that uh, sense of more communitarian uh, laden cosmopolitanism uh, is one way to, I think, limit at least the time for, uh, for that, that particular backlash. But it will take its course. I don't think it can be cut down very quickly. Hmm. Uh, there's a question way in the back. Oh, there you are. And yes, uh, if you could identify yourself. Uh, my my name is uh, John Inzo from China, now doing research at UCL. I'm just okay. making a uh, quick comment about Chinese GDP. I think it's a very interesting issue. Uh, um, you, you, you just mentioned that the, the Chinese GDP has been, uh, it's a f all fake. Uh, well, it, it, uh, in, in China, we Chinese uh, also question about our GDP, so I, I leave that. Well, uh, the, the, the truth is that uh, whether uh, it is underestimated or overestimated, uh, to, in my opinion, I think it is a, um, far underestimated because the, uh, if you look at the uh, indicators of Chinese GDP, you can see from uh, th their many indicators such as real estate, the transfer of land, has so all there, we do not calculate those indicators in, in Chinese GDP. If you know the Chinese, the, um, the, real, the growth of real estate and land, so you will see that there will be a okay. very, yeah. Is, <laughs> is there a question? Uh, that's a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Edward, do you have a question for this theory? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think I, the, the real point is that GDP is a very bad, whether the figures are um, real or invented, GDP is still a very bad measure of economic activity. It was a 
constructed in another age and me measures things that either um, don't matter or, uh, or, or are actually quite hard to measure. But I, I, I do think, and, and you're absolutely right, there's a lot of stuff in the Chinese economy which is absolutely stonking ahead. Um, there's other things that are, that are huge buried problems like the bad debts in the, in the banking system which are, very, um, which are state secrets. And it's very difficult if you cover um, the Chinese economy. It's one of the few economies in the world where you risk going to jail um, for leaking state secrets, doing um, what in other countries would be regarded as journalism. But I just want to very briefly on the 1989 question. It's, uh, it's an excellent one. I think the real point here is that in 1989, we assumed that the Western, and economic, uh, the Western political and economic system wasn't just better, but it was perfect. Because it was so much better than communism. And it was, and it was entirely right to try and make as many countries in the former captive nations as possible adopt Western-style politics and economics. But I think that we baked in a lot, there were actually, if you look back at the 80s, there were a lot of things wrong with the West then, and some of them are still, are still wrong now. And we are, we've been, I think, a bit, a bit slow in, in, in accepting that. Mm. You know, I just wanted, to, before we get another question, Minister Dombrovskis, I wanted to ask you something. I was in Georgia, uh, Republic of Georgia recently and some people were making the point that it's a specific issue but it's broader that Georgia wants to join NATO the EU it wants to be part of the West but Georgia but the prospects of its joining NATO are not very great right now obviously so the worry there is that because they are being told to wait some people, the Georgian population, may think, I don't have time to wait. Why, you know, Europe maybe doesn't want us. And ultimately, it might be easier to deal with the people that we know. And the people that we know are usually the Russians, or at least a system that existed uh, when the Soviet Union existed. And, and now, to a certain extent, there are Russian businesses investing all over the place. How do you answer people in those countries that are really on the border, that have not joined Europe or have not joined NATO, and who say, I want to, you know, throw my dice with Europe, but maybe they don't want us. Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, uh, Georgia and uh, also uh, some other Eastern Partnership countries, I would say most uh, notably uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, indeed, uh, uh, you see uh, that there is a willingness towards closer cooperation uh, with the EU. There is an interest in potentially becoming uh, members of the EU. Uh, and I think uh, from the uh, EU side, we also should be engaging uh, uh, closer with those countries, engaging closer with uh, Georgia, uh, engaging uh, uh, closer with uh, uh, Ukraine. Well, we know that the political reality is such that the EU membership for those countries certainly is not an uh, uh, issue of the uh, uh, nearest future. But at the same time, there are other ways how we can uh, engage with those countries we, through the association agreements and actually uh, using the full potential of those association uh, agreements through uh, free trade agreements, well, like DCFTA with uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, through uh, visa liberalization, something which actually uh, uh, citizens of those countries can uh, see as a tangible sign of getting closer uh, uh, to Europe through uh, a sectoral cooperation in a number of uh, areas. So there are actually many things what Europe can and should do to stay uh, engaged with those uh, countries and that's why we should be uh, uh, continue to pay uh, uh, attention and to be very active in uh, our uh, eastern partnership framework mm -hmm. uh, back to questions do we have another one there let's see uh, yes sir <laughs> uh, can we get the microphone it's down where is our microphone down here in the front Oh, you do? You have? He does have it? No, no. he does have the back. No, there's a chap at the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was somebody who already had it. Uh, Sir, why don't you go and then we'll move down to the front. Okay. He just wanted to we, we can hear you from there. I, 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 no, no, I you, can, you can ask a okay, question. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. My name is Kartik Desai. 
I'm chairman of the board of Sia Balto Events. My question is about uh, the Chinese impact. Now, on the one hand, EU has a greater stress for increased defense expenditure. On the other hand, there is going to be a greater impact from WTO provision. In December 2016, just two months away, China is uh, going to attain market economic status under section 15DA2 of WTO accession protocol. So according to this provision, there will be no anti-dumping legislation against any Chinese producers. We are just two months away. How best are the European industries equipped to take on this challenge? Hmm. Okay. And Is secondly, there, secondly, let's, let's deal with just okay, one. Sure. I think that's probably sufficient. Yeah. Um, Minister Dombrovskis, do you feel that you can handle that? Thank you. Uh, well, in indeed, uh, market uh, economy status for uh, uh, China's uh, uh, for China, it's uh, something uh, EU is uh, currently working uh, on, uh, while also working on appropriate uh, 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 safeguards for EU industry. Because uh, this, I would say, is a misconception if the country is a uh, 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 has a market economy status that it cannot be subjected to the anti-damping uh, measures within the WTO framework. Actually, the fact is that uh, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, uh, happening within WTO that also countries with a market economy uh, status are subject to those anti-damping measures. There are examples where, for example, US is applying uh, uh, anti-dumping measures to certain uh, EU countries and so on and so forth. So uh, there are still ways how actually also uh, we can uh, uh, protect uh, EU economy, EU industry against uh, certain uh, uh, trade practices. Mm -hmm. And now I think we'll, we'll get into this gentleman in front. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alexander Realis and I have the honor to be representing Greece in Latvia. Uh, Vice President uh, Dombrovskis uh, said in uh, his introductory remarks, among others, that Greece is going back to economic growth. This is one thing. I would like to invite his attention on my son's comment this morning, 24 years old, when he asked me why in in Europe who had one day to find out who were in economic crisis. Where were the absence of checking mechanisms since the conception of Europe until that uh, day? And a more general comment he made me, why his generation has to bear all the burdens of my generation? Actually, he told me, why you don't close the bills in your generation and to let our generation to be devoted to economic growth, to creativity in the whole of Europe? It is not restricted to British borders, that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, to a couple of questions there. I mean, Minister, you're, you're being asked a lot of questions. I can understand why. Um, could we all, maybe we start with Edward and then we'll go down the road. Well, I, I, I have children of the same age and they ask me these questions too and other even more difficult ones. Um, like, can, we ha can I have an, yeah. Um, uh, but I, I think the, um, <laughs> the, the, I think, I mean, you raise a very important point that for, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Greek problem is fundamentally about debt and competitiveness. And the, um, the blame for the lack of competitiveness rests with the people who were running Greece over the last 20 years. The blame for the debt is a bit more um, widely shared because for every reckless borrower, there's also a reckless lender. And one of the things that really annoys me about this crisis is that um, Greece is paying a huge amount of the pain um, for reckless loans that were made by banks, not least in Germany. And Germans were looking at very healthy, um, exciting 5, 6, 7, 8% returns on their, on their euros um, for loans that were actually very risky. And when the loans went sour, instead of the German savers taking the hit, which is what should happen when you make a risky loan, um, the uh, Greeks were told, now you have to pay it all back. Uh, exaggerating and simplifying a bit, but I think that you're right to um, feel about, uh, uh, you know, to, for your son and indeed for your own generation to feel annoyed about that. And there is, uh, I think Germany as the economic hegemon in Europe bears a very big responsibility 
um, for the prosperity of the whole country. And I, I sometimes worry that German economic policymakers look too narrowly at the German economy within the Eurozone and not enough at the wider issues in the Eurozone, particularly the welfare of the periphery. But I'm sure Mr. Dombrovskis will be happy to speak very bluntly and openly about this question. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, first, on, um, uh, on the Greek uh, uh, economy, uh, indeed, uh, uh, one can expect that uh, uh, now Greece is uh, turning uh, back to the economic growth, so uh, in a third quarter of uh, this uh, year, and uh, next year uh, we are going to see actually year-on-year -year growth in Greece uh, uh, as a whole. And actually, this was happening already in 2014, and for 2015, we already uh, uh, were foreseeing very strong economic growth, or, or reasonably strong economic growth of some 2.5%. Well, then political developments led it uh, elsewhere, so uh, uh, only now Greece is uh, coming back to the economic growth uh, uh, once again. Then on this uh, question of, uh, 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 of uh, a Greek uh, program and, and, and the debt. We know that those two uh, issues are also uh, linked as regards the Greek program. Uh, as I said, it uh, uh, seems to be on track. So the first review is concluded. The mission in Athens, uh, European Commission mission uh, in Athens is already there to prepare a uh, second review, uh, fiscal targets for last year and this year uh, 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 appear to be uh, met and the work is now ongoing on the next uh, year's uh, uh, budget. In parallel, there is uh, work ongoing on uh, debt measures. So what to do with the situation of uh, Greece's very high public debt which exceeds 180% of the GDP? And uh, it must be said that a number of things had already been done, including something which is called private sector involvement, which actually meant that uh, very substantial write-down of the outstanding private loans uh, to Greece, which has taken place already uh, several years uh, uh, ago. And now uh, uh, Eurogroup is looking at the ways uh, how to alleviate this Greek debt burden uh, uh, also on the official debt while excluding uh, nominal uh, haircut. This work is ongoing and it's likely to be a part of the discussions on the second uh, review. But it must be said that Greek debt already is on uh, uh, favorable conditions, very long maturities, very low interest rates, and as a result, Greece is paying on its debt servicing uh, as a, uh, a percentage of GDP less than, uh, for example, Italy or Portugal, which have substantially smaller debt-to-GDP ratios, well, substantially smaller, meaning still, still around 130% of uh, 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 GDP. But the de, de facto, those countries are paying more on their debt servicing already now uh, because of the fact that Greece is already getting very favorable uh, debt uh, uh, or loan conditions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is why we have Minister Dombrovskis on this panel, <laughs> because you know the subject. I think we have one to, uh, time for one more question. Um, yes, there's a woman asking a question. Yay. Uh, she's right there. <laughs> Hello. That's why I actually asked the question, for <laughs> that very reason, looking at this monochrome, monogender <laughs> panel and yeah. all the questions asked. I'm Latvian ambassador to the UK, my name is Baiba Braže, ah. and um, I have the question to the gentleman. And that deals both with the inequality, but also with the digital issues. As the Prime Minister Dombrovskis rightly said, it's a digital single market that will advance us to the next century and beyond. However, the people also need to be advanced. So how do we create the equality in terms of digital skills, literacy, critical thinking, media literacy in the EU and beyond? Is the Commission the driver? Are the Member States the drivers? What is the UK going to do it? I mean, I've been surprised about the 3G quality in the UK having 4G here and moving into the 5G in the future. 
what do we do about the people? Did Brexit had anything to do with it? Did people understand what they were doing? Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Was that directed toward Minister Jambrovskis or to whom? Please. Pardon? Ed Lucas and Prime Edward. Minister. Okay. Edward, you're on. Well, I, I think I need to start off with a series of apologies um, in ascending order of importance. First of all, that the broadband and mobile phone coverage in Britain is not up to Latvian standards, which is certainly true. Um, and secondly, um, slightly more importantly, for Brexit, which as, as a Brit, it was, I think, this, you know, one of the saddest, if not the saddest days of my life um, that we voted to do this. And I still hope that it won't happen in quite the appalling way that it seems to be happening now, but that remains to be seen. Um, on, you're absolutely right on digital and media literacy um, are really important. And I, having with three children who've all gone through um, what calls itself the British education system, um, I feel that uh, we've got a lot to learn from, from, from other countries in terms, and, and you know, particularly with the, 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 the idea of uh, the digital dispossessed people who basically don't have the skills to compete in the digital economy is a problem which is going to be with us for the next um, 30 or 40 years if we don't um, offer particularly sort of catch up. I do think, however, that one of the good things about the digital economy is it's broken the sort of state monopoly on education. You can now learn stuff free on the internet, um, remotely accessing the best teachers um, in the world um, for nothing. And that's true whether you're in Britain or Burundi or anywhere, anywhere else. So I'm, I'm on the whole, I'm an optimist about the, the digital economy. And I do think that that you know, and it is, uh, particularly if we can have some kind of you know, the digital single market within the EU and maybe Britain at least staying in that, if not in other things. Um, but you're absolutely right to highlight these questions of equality of access and, and the kind of rents that come if you're part of the cognitive elite, the sort of people in this room and our children, start off in life with such enormous advantages and um, they can live off those advantages for the rest of their lives in some cases and unfortunately everybody else has votes. Mm -hmm. Professor Devlin, you have not gotten quite as many questions. This sounds like something you'd have an opinion on and we're getting close to finishing so could you give your thoughts on uh, that? Sure. I think one way, and I actually wanted to add that when I was talking about robotics and advanced uh, technology debate, and same goes for the digital uh, skills, is um, it's one way to be able to train people and, and get them involved in how to deal with this digital gap. The other one, I think, is to think about ways of breaking the linkage between income and jobs. Uh, now, we always think about, you know, having an income is unless you are born rich somehow or having, a, you know, won the lottery, you work in a job and you get income, uh, which increasing technology, making certain skills uh, obsolete and with, with the incoming increasing rapid change in technology, making a lot of people lag behind, uh, endangers a lot of people's livelihood. Now, uh, one way to do, and economists among us would actually know this a lot better, one way to do is to, to develop some form of what they call basic income or universal income in certain places in Europe as well. Swiss actually sort of uh, refu you know, refused that in a, in a referendum recently, but I think it was in Norway in a local way they're trying to implement that. So there's a, a alternative ways of thinking about once we can actually weaken that link between having a, a basic set of income and having to have a job, then we can have people have more free time, more less worry about whether they're going to feed themselves and their families, and then we can actually try to uh, solve some of the problems that advanced technology, including robotics and all the all the other things that makes unskilled labor uh, unnecessary. Uh, we can lessen the impact of that on the people's lives and thus uh, lessen that. Uh, that totally thing. It's totally incompatible with open borders. Yes. You know, if that's you go true. down that basic income mm -hmm. road, you're that's going down the road true. of national fortresses mm -hmm. where you have a very, very sharp divide between mm -hmm. you know, Norwegians mm -hmm. who get the basic income and everybody else who, who doesn't. And I, so I, 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 I'm cautious about that. Yes. All right. Well, the debate can continue over dinner because we're, <laughs> we're out of time and that's the next event. So I want to thank our panelists. It was really a very stimulating educational discussion for me and I hope for our audience. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, 
Edward Lucas, Minister Dombrovskis, and also Professor Devlin. Thank you.